originated this new theory of why we're and what we're all about. He's a friend of mine from uh, Pasco, Washington. I've known him for about 10 years. He was old when I first met him, and he's still old. <laughs> and in the grain department, he's the area supervisor. He's a good teacher, and we call him the Gray Fox. And there uh, isn't very many things that he hasn't thought about. So I'd like to, at this time, introduce Vance Combs. And while he's walking up here, I would like to say that we're going to tape his presentation, and I'm sure that a lot of you will like to take it home with you, and it's being taped over in the control room, and if the quality is good, and I'm sure it will be, you can each uh, purchase one of these tapes, and I'm sure they'll be beneficial in any part of the country that you use them. Here you are, Vance. Good to see you. You're a brave girl. Where are you? What's left of you? Well, there you are. I've been facing this mob for 11 years. Look what it's done to me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very proud to be here. And at my age, I'm damn lucky to be here. I'm going to talk to you tonight about, uh, about five different subjects. I'm going to talk to you about three basic rules of conduct, human rules of conduct that we constantly tread upon, ignore, that are bound and determined to destroy us if we don't cease. And I'm going to bring them to your attention. We're going to talk about systems, what they can do, what they can't do, how simple they are. We're going to talk about the grain trader system. We're going to take a good look at the deep, dark secrets of the grain trader system. We are going to follow step by step the failure of that grain system in 1972 through a period of 73 and 74 and 75 when they reestablished that system and put you back in your cage. And if you listen in your memory real good, if you've ever been thrown in a drunk tank on Saturday night, there is a resounding clang when that door of that cage shut behind you. And if you'll listen real good, you'll remember about the time it happened. It was about the time that grain was no longer worth the cost of producing it. That's when you went back in your cage. And we're not going to leave you out on a limb. We're going to explain to you the G. 2000 R6 grain system that the NFO has built for you to use and Lois hereafter don't call it a contract for sale it is a system a complete system designed to take you from where you are at the present time to victory the cost of production plus a reasonable pro reasonable profit if you will use it and we're going to talk some more about that G2000 R6 grain system. Now these three laws that I referred to, being my first subject, are very simple. Number one, if a group failed to create its own system, then that group is doomed to serve another's. And I'm going to state these three basic laws of conduct, human conduct, 
and I'd like to get an agreement with you folks out of each one of these so we can have a meeting of the minds. If we have a meeting of the minds on these three basic things that we flounder around with, then we can accomplish something and soon, I'm sure. And if that sounds reasonable as a fact to you, then I'll go on to the second one. The second one is simply that if a system fails and there's no other to take over, you have a situation of complete chaos. And I think that's pretty uh, obvious. The third one is that if a group hold a service or a commodity that is essential to a basic industry, and that group is not contractable on the basis of a fair profit, then that service or that commodity will be forced out of you, the group will hold it, by repressive means. Now that's a little more complicated, and I'm going to do a little interpreting on it. Interpreting on it. I had a little trouble <laughs> understanding it myself when I wrote it. Of course, a lot of things bother me that wouldn't bother anybody else. <laughs> if a group, the American grain producer, hold a commodity, grain, that's essential to a basic industry, the international grain trader, and that group, the American grain producer, is not contractable on the basis of a fair profit, in other words, when you get 40 cents in your pocket ahead of the game, no, you won't talk to anybody anymore, then that commodity will be forced out of you by repressive means or low prices. Now let's go back to the beginning of that. Any group who fail to create their own system is doomed to serve another's. If a system fails and there's no other to take over, then you have chaos. And any group who holds goods or services, and I'm putting services in there for a purpose that I'm going to use a little later on, and they're not, it's essential to a basic industry and are not contractable on the basis of a fair profit, then that commodity or that service will surely be forced out of them by repressive means. I have just given you a complete history of the idiotic conduct of the American farmer and the reason that he's wondering why he can't make a profit and he can't price his product. He has failed to create his own system. Whenever the grain trader system failed, we had chaos, 72, 3, 4, and 5. And during the time when we, the grain trader system failed and we had the opportunity to write contracts and lock it in on a profit basis. Remember, folks, there wasn't one commodity coming off the American farm at that time that wasn't reflecting the cost of your production plus a reasonable profit. And that's sometimes a hell of a long ways ahead of a, a, a reasonable profit. But we weren't contractable. Therefore, we broke the, our ability to establish ourselves at that time. Now, how many more times can we afford to go around this circle? Now, there's three basic laws, and I want you to remember them. We're going to print them. We're going to have them in every kind of print that I can think of. And I hope you put them up by your phone and that you go to bed with them and do it some after, after dark reading. <laughs> or before you go to sleep, read them again, lodge them in your mind, because there's your hang-up, folks. Now let's talk about some systems. We have all kinds of systems. We have a postal system, a, a transportation system, a school system, none of them working very well, but they're there. There are all kinds of systems. Every day we are controlled and entrapped by systems. And not one of these systems was ever created for and by a farmer. He constantly serves everybody else's. 
Now, systems are very simple. They can do exactly what they were designed to do, nothing more and nothing less. And I'm going to give you some examples. Some of you folks have heard this, but you're going to have to hear it again because I, I'm afraid you'll forget it. I hold up something here and I say to you, you know what this is? No, what is it? It's a system. Well, what do you call it? It's a hammer. Well, what does it do? You drive nails with it. You take two boards and a nail and you hit it with a hammer and it puts them together so you got one board. Well, what are those two things that stick up on the back of it? That's a corrective system that was built into the hammer to correct mistakes that you make. <laughs> True, isn't it? Very simple. It can do exactly what it was designed to do. I hold, a, hold another object up here and you say, uh, well, what's that? Well, that's another system. What do you call it? It's a saw, dummy. Got teeth on this side and a handle on the back. And I guarantee you, if you put it down on the board and do this with it, you're going to do just exactly the opposite you did with a hammer. You're going to take one board and make two out of it. Isn't that a revelation? <laughs> but it's a system, folks, and it'll work if you use it. But you know what we try to do? We try to drive a nail with a saw, and we try to saw a board in half with a hammer. And boy, do we have a lot of problems. <laughs> but we insist on doing stupid things like this. We insist on thinking and hoping and praying to God that someday a system designed by and for the grain trade is going to somehow shower us with manna. If I have ever seen exercises in futility practiced by anybody anymore, then by farmers, I don't know where I could find it. I'm kind of like Mark Anthony. I didn't come to praise Caesar. I came to bury him. <laughs> Systems can do exactly what they were designed to do. Quit asking them to do something they weren't designed to do because they can't do it. Now let's take a good look at the grain trader system. What it has to do how it does it why it has to do it that way and how it destroys itself. What does a trader have to have? A little participation here. Don't be bashful just because I always shout you. What does a trader have to have? Any trader in any commodity. A grain trader has to have grain, doesn't he? That's all he has to have. Without grain, he's nothing. Keep that in mind. He's nervous. It has to... And it, what does that grain trader system have to do then? It has to furnish that grain trader an abundance of grain any place, any time he needs it. Right? And he designed it for that purpose. And you being uncontractable, <clears throat> you know, when I first became conscious of this situation, I had a different description for it. I thought to myself, if I was a grain trader and I woke up one morning and found that this <laughs> my source of supply was in the hands of an unpredictable, undisciplined mob <laughs> that didn't know what they wanted for the grain and had control of it, I think I'd go blow my brains out. <laughs> but that's the condition that the grain trader found himself in in 73. So how does he accomplish this? He does it like I told you, 
if you're uncontractable, then that commodity will be forced out of you by low prices. He does it with low prices. You see, it's just, it just follows that if you constantly produce more than he needs, and he'll make you believe it whether you do or not, that's part of his system, then he's going to convince you and force you to bring all of your commodity to town because he's going to keep the price level just below the cost of production, and he's going to force you to come to town with all your production every year to pay your bills, isn't he? So then it naturally follows, if that's the case, and I got some yeses out there, it naturally follows if that's the case, then inversely, if that thing pays a profit to you, it automatically destroys itself, doesn't it? It lost its capability of survival. The moment it pays you a profit and puts you through the transition period of from a short position in cash to them in a long position in grain, the transition is immediately, you're in a long position in cash and they're in a short position in grain. And they get awful nervous about that time. And they should. Because you're uncontractable. You are unpredictable. I won't, I won't call you a mob, because you really are. <laughs> when you're in that situation, you really are. So this is what happened to the grain trader system in 1972. The prices got up high enough so that you got in a long position on cash. And I suggested a cartoon here a while back for this, where there'd be a couple of little animated high heel gals in short skirts. One was the grain trader and the other was the grain producer. And the position you're in now, the grain, this little gal is the grain producer is on her knees begging the grain trader to buy her violets. And the grain trader is flipping his skirt up and walking off and saying, I'm in, I have all the violets I want. And then the transition period takes place and the grain trader says, please, won't you sell me your violets? And the little gal flips her dress and says, I want some more. The grain trader says, how much more? Hell, I don't know, I just want some more. So let us follow now, uh, step by step, what really happened to 1972, 3 or 4, and up to 5. The late in the fall of 1972, early in 73, grain prices began to rise. We'd made a large sale uh, to Russia, and the, the rising of the price uh, was caused by several things. One was that the enormous sale placed a heavy, heavy burden on the supply. Another was they kept it very quiet, and that developed an angry attitude on the part of the producers, so they held back all they could, angry, and rightly so, because they kept it very quiet. They were trying to buy all the cheap grain they could. They were trying to make their system work. They're not mad at you just trying to guarantee supply to fill their commitments. The NFO had an enormous block, and they reacted at that time and held an enormous amount of grain off. Whenever they got the price up a little too high, then some of the boys up in Montana, I know, started buying their CCC loans back. They began to repurchase the grain. And that slush fund or supply of grain that the CCC uh, loan program had developed for them began to dry up. 
Now they take a look at the amount of grain that's out there and the amount of grain that each one of them is committed for and the enormous load it's going to put on the logistical capability of the United States and they decided they had to get covered early. So they went to the country and they went to bidding. They couldn't get it out of CCC, so they went to bidding, and they bid it up, and it got up above two bucks. <coughs> About that time, that was poor boy grain, remember? On a dollar and a quarter loan, two bucks isn't much today. That was pretty good grain then. It was poor boy grain. We sealed three, four crops, years crops, and they began to buy it back, and the banker says, damn, this is a good loan. I think I'll just furnish a little money for this. I'll make some interest off of these boys instead of giving the government that CCC stuff. So everything began to fall in your lap. You didn't know why, but it fell in your lap. And you became arrogant. In fact, you came, became downright impossible, not only in grain, but in other commodities. And if any of you want to re argue with me, remember I was around, one of the boys that was around, saying to you, come on, fellas, if grain's six dollars and it's worth five to produce it now, or four and a half, or whatever it was, plus a nice profit in there, let's write some contracts for that. And you're saying to me, what the hell are you talking about? Asking me to, to sell grain for a dollar under the market? No, I was just asking you to extend your contracts on the cost of the uh, profit, fair cost, fair profit, the reason that I thought we all joined the NFO. But every time a staffer would mention something like that, you guys would reach for the tar bucket. Get out of here. You, you've all heard the old story about the dollar calf card. 72 cent, 73 cent calf card, and somebody sticks a dollar. Everybody told that. But I do know what happened in Wishick, North Dakota. Because I was threatened there that night. I got some North Dakota people out here backing me up on that. So that's one thing I'm not lying about tonight. <laughs> Proud of that. So we became so ridiculous that the traders could not fill their commitments. They were buying $6 grain out of Canada to fill $3 and $4 commitments with. And you know, even Cargill can't do that very long. That begins to run into trouble. So they stopped that. We're going to trace it with you now a little bit. Then the president came out and he threw an embargo. And there's no faster way to build a surplus in this world than to throw on a embargo, an embargo and then open the boundaries and, and borders for imports. Well, you're really building her then. So he scared the devil out of the Japanese because they were depending upon soybeans for the protein supply for their people, not their animals. And they loaded up a few shiploads and sent them down to Brazil and jerked out the coffee trees. And the next year we got Brazilian beans in the market and they're not coffee beans. You can't even get any to drink. They're, they're Brazilian soybeans. And the traders are aesthetic. Aesthetic, absolutely happy. They've got more commodity to trade, you see. They have an abundance again. And don't think they didn't know what they were doing. About that time, they sent Kissinger overseas, and he negotiated some cancellations on some contracts over there. The State Department had to get involved in it. You see how important you people are? Uncle Kissinger lost face. He had to go do some hard swapping, so he did. And the government didn't like that at all. So the president surfaced again and he said, I'll raise my right hand. That guy was always raising his right hand, wasn't he? <laughs> and I'll swear to you that if you will plant fence to fence, you dummies, <laughs> that I will never again put on an embargo. In fact, the Congress just passed a law that stated and if we had a sufficient amount of product here, we could no longer have embargoes. And what did you do? You went out that year and you planted 
And in January, when they came with their projections, they said planted acres times normal yield is going to equal 2.2 billion bushels of wheat, the largest wheat crop we had ever grown by about 500 million bushels. You see yourself headed for the cage? You can almost hear the door slam, can't you? And what did he do? He didn't put on an embargo, he put on contract review. For five months, he built you a surplus in wheat of 100 million bushel a month. He let a little out and held the most. What happens when you keep get that price back down? What does it stimulate? It enormously stimulates research toward more efficient production, producing more and more and more and more. You see the fallout that comes with low prices? And the American farmer goes for it. You went for it. Every one of you went for it. Getting bigger. If I could just produce a little more, if I could use genetics to get it two more kernels of wheat on that head, it wouldn't shake out if it got ripe and I could get the combine under it before it combine under it before it hit the ground. Then I would make it. But ladies and gentlemen, think a moment. You have a cost that's less than a, a price that's less than the cost. The cost is sitting in here, and you're trying to close the gap between your cost and that price with efficiency, with genetics, with chemicals, by getting bigger tractors and bigger lash-ups. God, don't you know you don't, you don't control this price, and as soon as you move up to it, they'll move it away from you again? Because the minute you reach it and grab it, their system de is destroyed. And you're automatically back in your cage again because you're uncontractable. They're going to put you back in there. This is what happened to you. Now, they used a lot of other methods. They fixed you up a real nice farm loan program again. Real nice one. And we're going for it, just like a bunch of big fat dummies. I'm going to tell you something. How do you test a, a situation? I'll tell you how simple it is. You say, if I was getting the cost of production plus a reasonable profit, would I need that program? I'm going to ask you, if you were getting the cost of production plus a real reasonable pro, uh, uh, cost of production plus a reasonable profit, would you need the government loan program? Well, then what the hell are you using it for? <laughs> if it isn't good under those conditions, it's not good under bad conditions. There's only one solution to it. It's use your own system. <laughs> now I'm going to talk to you about the R6 grain system. I don't want you ever again to call it a contract for sale. It is the system. It was designed as a system. The basic concepts of that thing were thought about a long time. Many of us went back through the failure of the previous systems. We said, what is wrong? What does a system have to be to take us from where we are to victory? Our goal, the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Well, in the first place, it's got to have two sections. It's got to have an operating section, and it's got to have a bank section, a savings account. Well, if you've got a brain in your head, the first thing that's going to snap in your mind is, if we have to take all our grain to town every year to pay our bills, how the hell are we going to keep anything in the savings account? So that's why you got acres. 
There's a reason for everything that's in that contract as it forms itself into a system. In section one, which is the operating day-to-day -day area of your system, was designed exactly that way so that you could keep a cash flow, so that we, as we learn to use it, would not become too heavily involved and get in too much trouble. You see, when you start using a system, the people who have designed it are going to teach it to you. Not always, but the NFO does. And then we tell you, you tell us. We show you, you show us. This is what your staff is for, to teach. And then we practice for perfection. And where do we practice? On our day-to-day -day business. And the bargainers get awfully upset when you send in 800 bushel. But if you have to go with 800 bushel, tell them you're just practicing. <laughs> Also, in that area of practicing, you have another golden opportunity. You see, every military operation, and this is sure one of them, you have an attack plan, you have a retreat plan, an orderly retreat plan, and you have a reserve in the background. And in section one, you can take your block, let it build, offer it out there for I don't care what price. If it doesn't go that month, you haul it back and stick her back in section two. You know, it runs both ways. That's a good system we got. It'll do anything. So we shine it up, Put her out there next month, maybe a little lower, maybe a little higher. Lower the amount and increase the price. You know, yo-yo it a little bit. That's what they do to you all the time. God knows we ought to know how to do that. We've been the victim of it all through my life. That's a long time. That's the way you can play with that thing. These are the things you must learn to do with your system. Function with it. Section two, I'm not going to dwell on that anymore because you can, you can imagine anything you want to do with that. If, you, if you, you know what a quarterback is, damn it, pick out a few quarterbacks out through the country. Let them, let them call the plays and see how many things you can do to screw up the present marketing condition. And believe me, you've got a system that will really follow it. It will turn it upside down. In your section two, you're going to have some grain. And as long as they're going to keep, they can keep those prices below your cost of production, you're not going to have an awful lot. But you can put in your acres. I came into Great Falls, Montana in 1973 in January, no, 74 January, pardon me. And Frank Kraft, we were working on this thing at the time. A great many of us were, many, many people in the NFO were working on this thing. I'm going to slide back a minute. You see, prior to that time, we had a, 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 R, a G2000R6, merely means that grain, 2000 contract for sale, R had been revised six times, six. Well, we had a, we had a, <laughs> we had an R4. We had an R4 that said, in 90 days, if we don't sell it, we're going to give it back to you. Well, it only took the grain trade <laughs> about two weeks to adjust to that. Hell, why buy it from NFO? We're going to have it back in the market at two bits under at the end of 90 days. And then we, we had an R5. This was a real good one. See, 
I, I, don't, don't blame us for being smart because we weren't about that time. <laughs> you know what we did with that one? We thought 90 days was too long to hold it, so we just put it out there 30 days. Boy, did the trade love that one. <laughs> so we decided we better have something else. <laughs> and many of us were working on this thing. And I walked in, and the January projections for 1974 crop were in. And Frank says, you know, they're killing us. Right now, they're breaking our market for next September with projections. You hog men that have raised some hogs. Every time we go around the circle on hogs, we lose a market nine months before the pigs get to market. They count the number of bred sows and break your market with it. So they came out with planted acres times normal yield is going to equal 2.2 billion bushel. And they said we got about uh, 2 billion bushel, uh, 200 million bushel carryover, which gives us 2.4 or something like that. And we're going to have an 100 and, uh, 1 billion, 100 million bushel disappearance on export and about 900 million on domestic, which says we're going to have oh, about 2 billion bushel we're going to need. And we're going to have about 400 million bushel over. So we're in a comfortable position, and down comes the markets. They did it to you right here in, in Iowa last June with the same figures. They said 600 million bushels of corn in the state of Iowa. 200 million was in common storage, and 400 million was on farm, and they busted your corn price. And they got you all ready to whenever you were going to go with your corn, you'd put it back into the system because that was the best price you had offered to you was a loan. Remember? What did you have? Not a damn thing. You couldn't do anything with it because you didn't have it on a contract for sale. So Frank says, we got to do something. We got to have acres in that prog program that we're working on. We got to sign acres. We got to talk, be talking about the same thing they're talking about at the same time they're talking about it. So that when they come out and they give us this garbage, then we say, "Hey, hold it, hold it! All visible grain is not, grain is not available anymore. There are two piles of grain. There's the one that you've been looking at all the time, and there's another one over here called the NFO block, and it's behind that contract you respect because we deliver on it now." So we take our contracts, we audit them, we certify the audit, and by using their own multipliers, we don't argue with them. Before you know we'd argue, we'd spit around the stove all winter and say, I don't think it, they, they, they got that many acres planted. Who cares? Use their numbers, their multipliers. And here, we've got 700 million bushel on the acres in wheat. And we got a million bushel carryover, 100 million bushel carryover. So that's 800 million. And you take that from your 2.4, and that leaves you, what, 1.6. And you already said you had to have 2 billion to fill your commitments. Man, you're 400 million bushels short instead of 400 million over. You see how your system can work? Anytime you have a problem with a system, spike it into the system. If the system devours it, you have a good system. If it pukes it up, then fix it. <laughs> and I have yet to find a, system, a, a problem in grain, and man, I've been faced with all of them, that that system can void, can't correct and straighten up. And that's where we try it, day after day after day. Will the system absorb it? Will it take care of it? Absolutely. All you got to do is work the system by putting your grain and your acres under the contract for sale. Now, what has happened at this point? The grain trader is no longer an enemy. An adversary, yes. We're no longer an enemy. You have stabilized this great industry. 
You have given it the dignity of a price. The grain trader knows what he's going to pay for grain down the road six months or a year because of your formula. You sent those kites up there in the, in the, in the Board of Trade to the racetrack to make a living, where they belong. And you have given dignity and stability to the most honorable of all industries in this world. The industry that produces the most important, essential form of energy on the face of the earth. The form of energy that keeps every living thing on this earth that has blood flowing through its veins alive. Try that with oil once. And we are the only people on this earth that can do it. And now you know. When you came through that door tonight, most of you didn't know what I told you or hadn't been able to put it in that context. And every one of you could find some excuse somewhere for not committing your grain on a contract for sale with the NFO system. But now, damn it, you know. And there are no further excuses for you walking out of here in this convention without a complete and total commitment. <laughs> We're not going to go home and say, what did Kansas do? What did Oklahoma do? What did Montana do? What did Michigan do? What did Illinois do? Damn it, you wouldn't even know where the state line was if somebody didn't put a sign up on it to tell you. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So we have now arrived at a point to where we know what we're supposed to do. You have no, no. One of the main tools that they use to keep their system alive is a 10 cent dime. Well, it's about a 4 cent dime now. <laughs> That is the biggest stumbling block that the American farmer has, is that dime. I'm going to leave something with you before I wind down here. I'm about through. But I'm going to tell you something. I was asked today in a staff meeting what the contract for sale or our NFO system was worth to the American farmer. And grain alone. Well, let's do some simple arithmetic. There's around 12 billion bushel of, of grain produced in the United States every year. And if you got a dime, every one of you, you don't get the dime because they just pick out the chosen few and give them the dime, the agitators and the guys that can scream the loudest. Look, I got a dime more than you did. Big mouth. They get the dime. But if every one of you got a dime, you know how much you'd have? You'd have a billion, two hundred million. You're short about two bucks. You need about two bucks more right across the board. And do you know you're shorting yourself? for that dime that one of you get once in a while, you keep feeding the monster hoping he'll consume you last. <laughs> and you leave two times 12 billion is $24 billion on the table. $24 billion you people are leaving on the table that you'd have for spendable income if you had the guts and the foresight to work together and stabilize this great industry. Now, the economy is, a point, is, is a, a, on a multiplier of seven. So what you're actually doing to the American economy by not living up to your responsibilities and pricing your price on the basis of a fair profit over, over your cost is about $168 billion a year. Take $24 billion and multiply it by seven. I think it'll come up with about 600 and some, I don't know. It's an, it's an absolute mind-boggling figure. And we wonder why we're having a depression. And I'm looking right at you. <laughs> I'm going to close with this statement. I have met the enemy. 
and he are us. Good evening, folks. <laughs>